All right, it's a minute after, and we, people are going to be coming and going on this. I've, I've talked to several people who said, um, well, you know, I, I'll, I can't get on until about 1.30, and, and others have said I have to leave early. So let's, let's just go ahead and start. Um, thank you all for joining. I'm John Rosales. Um, uh, we're doing this under the auspices of the Niles S. Night Silent Film Museum. Of course, Niles, like everybody else, is shut down because of the pandemic. So uh, what the museum has been trying to do is fill out, um, instead of having live film programs, they've been filling out with a series of programs. They did a virtual um, Chaplin Days, they've done virtual Bronco Billy. Uh, throughout the summer and fall, we're trying to do programs every weekend. There's film presentations, uh, interviews, uh, some panel discussions, uh, there's more things uh, planned. I would encourage all of you to go to their website, which is uh, nihilusfilmmuseum.org. And, uh, and, and just click on the schedule button and you can see there's, there's literally something every weekend going on. So, so I want to, uh, to encourage all of you to, to check out the various programs they have. Um, what we're going to do today is that I came up with this idea of doing something where we bring together some silent film accompanists. And I've already had people say, well, why didn't you invite this? Why didn't you invite you know, this other person? I, I wanted it to be kind of a small, intimate group. I thought more than about five people was going to become a little too chaotic. And, and I'll be honest and say, I organized this, so I picked all my favorite friends and accompanists, <laughs> which, is, which is my purview of doing this. Um, um, we're going to go ahead and you, we're going to do this. I'm going to act as the moderator, and we'll ask some questions, get discussions going. But then I think what we'll do is, I hope it actually becomes a little bit more of a free-for-all with the accompanists, talking about stuff. We can, we can debate. We can argue with each other. We'll do this for probably about an hour, and then maybe a little after the top of the next hour, we'll pause, and then we'll take start to take questions. And we'll uh, we'll do some Q and A. Uh, uh, all of you on Zoom at the bottom is a little button that says chat. If you click the uh, the chat button, you'll see uh, you know a little window will come up. You can type in a message. I think it should usually say to everyone. Like don't send it to a specific person because uh, then no one else will see it. But if you can put the chats in, um, we'll um, you know we'll get to your questions, and we'll do that a little later. But um, let me start. I just want to very quickly introduce who we have on the line. Um, we have, and I'm going to do these in about half a sentence per person because they're going to tell you about themselves shortly. Um, we have the Niles people. Will know Frederick Hodges. Frederick, like myself, is one of the regular accompanists out at Niles. He's based in the Bay Area. Uh, but then we have a lot of East Coast folks, and uh, some of you in California may be less familiar with them, um, unless you're regulars at events like Cinecon or the San Francisco Silent Film Festival. Um, but they Which are, none of us play at. Yeah, they, they, are, they are people who you know from, from online streaming. From, from well, I don't play that often. <laughs> yeah, but you know them from mostly Lost, from Cinecon, from the Columbus Cine event, um, Library of Congress. They play along the East Coast. And so we've got Andrew Simpson, and Andrew, it's actually Dr. Andrew Simpson. Uh, teaches music and uh, play performs regularly on the East Coast. He's got DVD releases and uh, many of you know from Mostly Lost and he performs regularly at the Library of Congress. Phil Carley is based in Rochester, New York, also Dr. Philip Carley. Um, the, uh, Phil has played for years at George Eastman House, travels around. Uh, he and Andrew both actually have conducted orchestras and come up with orchestral scores. Ben Modell is based in uh, New York. Uh, ben has uh, ben. I've actually known Ben longer than any of you. I met Ben in 1982 when he was um, a teenager playing at Cinecon, and I was asked to kind of coordinate. They said, well, this kid wants to come in and play, and that's when I first met Ben. Uh, ben uh, runs Undercrank Productions, which has done a lot of great silent DVD releases. Also play, actually, Ben travels a lot. I'm always seeing Ben showing up in foreign countries playing. <laughs> um, and then Maki Matsumura. Uh, plays, uh, again, in the New York City area. She has played around on DVD releases. Um, and uh, I met her actually at the now defunct Syracuse um, Cinefest, or Cinefest, excuse me, um, and uh, which was the first time I had heard her play a number of years ago. So th that is who our panel is. And what I'm going to do now is I think I'd just like to start with each person. I'm going to give everyone two, three minutes. Just say a word about how, how did you get started? You know, where, did you start from a musical background and then decided to move into films? You know, what what inspired you 
to, to do this? And, and maybe let me, I'll, I'll, I'll go with the traditional gentlemanly ladies first and ask Makia if she can, <laughs> she can start. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I am by far the least experienced among today's panel, and I have been studying music since I was four or something, and I'm originally from Japan, and I moved to New York for my graduate school, and I came to the U.S. wanting to do uh, uh, film music, but I didn't know there's such a thing as silent film companies existed, because back in Japan, we always have the narrator to, you know, tell the story when we show the silent film and the music was optional. So coming from that, that background, I didn't know anything about this until back in 2003 when uh, Ozu, that, that year was Ozu's uh, centennial year since his birth and Shochiku did this um, global um, retrospective and they screened the, the entire I think all the movies of, um, made by Ozu that's still existing, which included 16 silent films. And I actually got a call from Tokyo a National Film Archive if I would be interested in giving it a try to play for silence. And I was like, what is it? <laughs> um, so, and uh, so Tokyo, I, the lucky for me, the Tokyo was the last stop for that retrospective, and I got to see the New York version a few months before I was to go home and play for this. And it was Donald Sosin at the Lincoln Center, uh, Film Society of the Lincoln Center. He was the only one playing for all 16 films. So yeah, I, com I attended virtually every screening there, and I introduced myself to Donald and explained my situation. He kind of gave me some pointers as to how to prepare, and also just you know by listening to him play for those films taught me a lot. So I did this like really <laughs> quick and dirty <laughs> Um, the preparation, if you call it that, um, and then flew back to Tokyo, and back back there, I think there are five or six pianists taking turns. Uh, each were assigned to two to three films, and we play. We got to play them twice, I think. And I think I got to play. I was born, but and a couple other uh, shorts twice, and so that was my very first experience playing for silent live in the theater in front of this big screen. So I didn't know what to expect. And then I grew up uh, studying piano and composition. And also I was trained to do this free form improvisation since I was a kid. Uh, so I can't do a jazz impro, but I could, you know, come up with freeform music as long as I wanted to. So that actually <laughs> fit very nicely with this silent film accompaniment. So I survived. Uh, I was born, but twice. <laughs> and um, so I've been performing in public since I was eight. And I always had a really terrible stage fright. But when I was playing for silent films for the first time ever, I had such an excitement and joy during I was performing. And I was surprised. Wow, I'm not nervous at all. And I'm like fully present. And I felt like I was collaborating with the, you know, the late Ozu himself because I could feel his, you know, editing, you know, breathing, the way he's telling the story. And I was, I felt like I was playing with him. And that was such a unique experience and such a fulfill, fulfilling thing for me. I felt like always I had to pick if I'm going to be a composer or if I'm going to be a pianist all my life up until that point. But I felt like I have been trained to be doing this all my life. So that clicked. <laughs> and the rest is, yeah, history. All right. That's how I got into it. Yeah, we all we all have different origin stories. It's like like watching a Marvel movie. You know, how did each person get their superpowers? But <laughs> yes, thank you for that. And this is we those of us who do this know it, it is a kind of superpower if to, to do it well. It's not. The, I've heard a lot of really great uh, performers, some of whom really weren't very good silent film accompanists. They could play piano magnificently and just didn't work. So um, and Maki, I love. Maki is playing. It's quite lovely. Um, Frederick, how about you? What, what's you? You've been playing around the Bay Area, playing with orchestras, playing with uh, you know with twenties music bands. What, how did you get into this? Well, uh, I guess we have to start um, when I was a kid. I received for 
Christmas, of course, received because I asked for it when I was about 10 years old, a little Super 8 projector from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. And it came with um, several cut down versions of silent movies from the Black Hawk studio. And oh my goodness, I loved watching those movies. But of course they were silent. Uh, there's no soundtrack on these Super 8 films. And I didn't know what else to do. So I would play uh, Scott Joplin records, LPs, as some sort of accompaniment. And so that was my introduction to silent movies. But then I, um, when I was in graduate school, I was the president of the Film Society. And I got to choose the movies and I regularly ran silent movies on our film program. And they always came with a, uh, with a soundtrack, except once. We were playing Pandora's Box. The film starts and it's dead silent. Absolutely no accompaniment. Well, you can't have a movie without accompaniment. And just on the spur of the moment, not knowing what else to do, I ran down because in front of the screen was actually a piano there for some, another reason. And I just started improvising, feeling I'm terrible, I, but I have to save the day or people are going to storm out and demand their money. And um, <laughs> somehow people didn't storm out and they didn't ask their money back. And, and then years later, um, after I graduated, I came back to the United States and I uh, was working as a you know, full-time pianist and I got hired to be a substitute for a friend of mine who worked with something called the Great Nickelodeon Troupe, which was a group that Russell Merritt of UC Berkeley, a film studies professor, put together to be um, a, a musical act, as you might have seen in a Nickelodeon theater in about 1910. And um, their regular accompanist couldn't make one gig, and they asked if I would substitute. And it involved accompanying little five-minute Georges Méliès films and doing a little other accompaniment on song slides. And the performance was at the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum. And I think it was their very first Bronco Billy Festival. It was in June and it was, in, it was very hot. Rena might be able to give the exact date, probably about 2002, 2003. And um, after our performance, the president of the, uh, the museum, Dorothy Bradley, came up to me and said, how would you like a job? <laughs> and, I, and I said, what are you talking about? And she said, no, I want you to come a, a, be one of our uh, a, accompanists. We've got a stable of accompanists. I'm sure we can find room for you. So she took a chance on me and suddenly I'm a professional silent film accompanist. And well, I've been among, among many other things. things. You've, uh, I have regularly heard Frederick perform with the California Pops. And, uh, and that's always a lot of fun as well, which, you know, it's, a, it's uh, having done it once and never wanting to do it again, uh, playing with a, you know, with a 60 piece orchestra is, uh, is a little bit overwhelming. So, well, it's, it's a lot of fun and I'm glad I get to do that and accompany silent movies. Yeah. Of course, we're talking pre-COVID. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I hope that we'll eventually go back to our regular routine of performance. We'll get to COVID-19 music performances later in, in this. Um, so I, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Philip next, but you said something that reminded me of one of my favorite Phil Carley stories, um, where you said you had to race to the uh, up to the piano. Uh, Phil, I'm sure you'll remember this. It was, I believe, the 1997 Cinecon, and there was a Oh God. Yeah. I'll say, I'll say a, a prominent organist who I will not name was scheduled to play a film and before the film well, we all know who you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> before, before the film there was a I think it was a Mary Pickford one real short. And and this organist was I wasn't contracted to play the short, so it hit the screen silent. And Phil from the back of the auditorium raced like a bolt of lightning down the aisle up there and play, you know, missed the first 40 seconds of the short and then played the short before the big name organist came in and played the feature after. Um, and so that's one of my well done, favorite well, I, memories <laughs> of I'll, Phil. I'll add a little postscript or prescript to that. Uh, the person in question had uh, telephoned the uh, George Eastman Museum where I was archivist at the time and uh, asked for a screener of the film, and I said it hadn't come back from the lab yet. 
Um, and I said, it's only one reel. Uh, there's a very good synopsis in the moving picture world. Um, you know, you can take a look at that. And, um, and the last I heard was, okay. And it wasn't until I was actually seated with the Mary Pickford folks up in the balcony. That's uh, because the person whom we are speaking of came out and did presets on the organ and went off stage. And then they announced that the film was about to start and that this was the first time this film had been seen since its release. It was an imp one reeler. And when uh, the, you know, our archival credits came up and there was no sign of the celebrated organist, that's when I went, oh God, he's not going to do it. And that's when I ran down. <laughs> All right. So, so, so that, that's the back story to that. So, um, so with that as a lead in, Phil, tell, how did you get started? It's kind of weird. It, I almost started, I started with film before I started with music. Uh, because because I got fascinated with silent films at Disneyland um, at the Main Street Cinema. Uh, for those of you who have never been to Disneyland before it has turned into all mouse, uh, in the 60s, uh, and I was five, I remember this, um, you have six screens, uh, six separate screens which ran films on loops. And there were six different films running. Um, and one of them was The Great Train Robbery. And the reason I know that is that I kept on watching it over and over again. And when we got home, my sister and I, with my mother and a Super 8 uh, film camera, made our own version. And that was actually the year before I started piano lessons. I started when I was six. And uh, when I started, I was fascinated with the piano. I was fascinated with films. I was, to cut a story short, a long story short, I was fascinated with improvising and composition. So I just was wondering what the boobering was going on. Anyway, um, anyway, um, well, I just kept on improvising and. I always looked for silent films when we lived in England, and I looked for silent films. My father left me for two hours in a newsreel cinema, alone in Piccadilly Circus, so I could watch Hartley Chaplin's The Count over and over again in the 45-minute program. But to get into playing it, I, I read and I saw a lot of the films I could, and I'd seen The Hunchback of Notre Dame like nine times because it was the only 16 millimeter drama that was in the county film library. And I wanted to see a drama, I'd seen comedies. We had the adventure at my eighth birthday party on the eight millimeter. So I kept on watching it over and over and over and over and over again. And then finally, just for larks, I borrowed it and set it up at my junior high school with a best friend of mine being the projectionist and his sister being the audience, just to see if I could do it. Um, because when I'd shown it at home, I used to put on uh, the Beethoven Third Symphony played by Bruno Walter as the accompaniment, going over and over and over again. And um, I did that, and a couple of teachers came through and wondered what the hell was going on. And then they asked me to play for the school. So I played it for the school for the end of the year. And the next year, uh, my parents suggested that I do this as a summer job for their college. They were in uh, community education. And they thought it would be a nice program for their individual colleges, Palomar College in San Marcos, and a branch of Maricosta College, uh, uh, which was in uh, Del Mar, California, near San Diego. So I started doing those. Um, I kept on reading. I kept on taking piano lessons. I kept on playing. Um, I did it every summer. I came home from college. This went on for 30 years. And um, it, 
it really did go on for years and years. And I started doing it at college because I had to take humanities courses. I had to, I ended up being uh, in Harry Gettle's course. Harry Gettle was um, head of the film department at IU. And it was a graduate course, but he says, well, if you play for the course, you'll get an A. And I said, well, I want to come to the course. He, he was a great historian. So I went and I kept on playing. Well, when I went to graduate school, I gave it up. Uh, when I went to Indiana, uh, when I went to Houston, actually I completely given it up. I was going to focus on being a musicologist, but then there were some family circumstances that happened. And I went back in, I asked the University of Rochester professor if I could attempt me for his comedy course. And he was very surprised and uh, he said, sure. And I played for him and then he recommended me to Chris Warack at the George Easton House. And I played one show there and sight on the They wanted to just throw me at it. It was just after power playing the course. And I remember the picture. It was three women, uh, Lubitsch. I'd never seen it. Because I said, can I see it first? And they said, no. Nah. And so I just went and did it and I got the cup. And then it went from there. The rest, as they say, is history. Well, I remember actually, I when the when the Syracuse uh, Cinefest began, it was in 1981. I was the only accompanist for like the first seven or eight years. It was just me, and I mean, I remember there was wow. one year that I had the flu, and uh, they had 16 and a half hours of silent films, and I was getting over the flu, and I was sick as death. And then I think it, I, Phil, you might remember the year was about it was the late 80s. I want to say maybe it was about 88 or 89. Bill Serling came to me and said, "Well, we got this young guy." And, and he plays, and you know, would would you mind if he plays? I said, well, is he, is he, you know, how is he? Is he good? And they said, well, we've heard him at Eastman House. You know, he's he's good. I said, well, I'll tell you what, let's let him play one film, and if it, you know, if it's good, we'll we'll work something out. And Phil, I remember the film. It was the Copperhead that you played. That's right. And and I said, this guy's great. And I'm reading the film. I said, you and I, I said, you and I are split in the film. So now we're just only playing eight or nine hours of film. And that was I didn't know that. That was the first time I met Phil. Well, I remember when I met Phil Serling because he came and heard me play at, at, at uh, the Eastman House. At yeah, the drive. He said he'd heard you at Eastman. Yeah. And I remember the picture. It was Love Him and Leave Him. Oh. And he came out, and I was introduced to him before the show by Chris, and he was nice, but kind of like, well, um, nice to meet you, you know, in, in, in the Phil voice. And uh, afterwards, he came up to me, and he went, wow, you know, it was good, kind of like Phil. It, Phil being very enthusiastic was very intoxicating. It was, it was really quite lovely. And then, and so then Phil and I were the two accompanists at Syracuse for many, 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 many years. And then in more recent years before it shut down, they started bringing, then rotating and bringing other people in. And quite a yeah, bit. Gabriel uh, Thibodeau would come down. Gabriel would sometimes come in as a guest and play, mm -hmm. play one year. Um, all right, I just keep, keep moving along. Uh, oh, Adam, you froze, John. Um, and, um, am I frozen? Or did I freeze? I don't know what's going on. Ben, how about, how about you? Give us oh. your origin story. Uh, yeah. Um, I I uh, I grew up uh, obsessed with silent movies. Uh, I am told by my folks that I discovered Charlie Chaplin on television when I was a toddler, because they used to show silent movies on television, and um, uh, was in, just interested in in, in 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 silent film and in filmmaking. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of New York. Uh, and I was a Super 8 filmmaker and uh, went to, to film school at NYU. But I arrived there having seen a great deal of silent film, not just because of uh, the silent years, because the series had aired on, Killiam, on, on public television produced by Killiam Shows with Bill Perry's music. But I, I lived in the same town as Walter Kerr, who wrote this, a book called The Silent Clowns, which I happen to have over here for those of you who don't this is the book I wrote him a letter when I was 12 uh, I had gotten the book as a as a gift 
uh, from the family of a, a guy whose, whose name may be familiar to you, a guy named George Feltenstein, who's a, a few years a, ahead of me in school. Um, but anyway, I wrote a letter to Walter Kerr, and he called me a few days later and offered to show me stuff from his collection. Uh, so for many years, uh, I, I would go over to his house, always on a Monday night because he was a drama critic. And so I got to NYU, uh, having seen lots and lots of stuff, and I had been taking piano lessons since I was five. I had a good teacher who taught me some theory. Uh, I had to do classical music, but I was also interested in, in ra ragtime. It was the 1970s. It was all over the place. Um, and the, the, you know, the film production program, you have to take a, a first, in your first year, a film history course, an overview class, like a lot of people do. The first semester is sound, the second semester is sound. And the films were shown, because this is before home video, they were shown, com they were shown in 16 mil prints, double perf prints with no tracks, and they would just sit there and, and die in front of a couple hundred film students every week. <laughs> and so there's two things. One, so um, what, what I thought was interesting was what Machia was saying about stage fright. I didn't have stage fright, but I had never been in, I mean, I had played in band, but that's not the same thing. I had never really given a recital. Ex uh, I was excruciatingly uncomfortable at that time in <laughs> getting up in front of people uh, to do anything. Uh, so the, there's a piece of my origin story I don't understand or remember uh, because uh, my sophomore year, I approached the head of the department and the guy, who, uh, a guy named Robert Sklar, Bob Sklar, um, who taught the overview class, and I thought uh, I would like to try playing uh, piano for the silent films. Um, I still don't know why I thought this was a good idea, um, but they were all for it. And so, unlike most people, my first, the first film I ever played for uh, was probably one of the Lumiere brothers' <laughs> actualities. I didn't yeah. have to dive in with Potemkin <laughs> or Napoleon or anything. It was just a train pulling into the station. Uh, but what I did uh, is I made a point of meeting the people who were already doing this and try to learn from them. So I met uh, Stuart Oderman, uh, who had a little advice for me, which didn't quite resonate for me, but uh, he and I became friends later on. Uh, I, met, I went straight to MoMA, and I met William Perry, or Bill Perry, had a few conversations with him, had a nice conversation with, with Donald, uh, I think I, I think I met Steve Sterner, and and then I met Lee Irwin. And Lee Irwin, uh, I see I see Joe Ransky's face light up. Uh, Lee Irwin was a film organist in the 1920s, um, and uh, had his trajectory went from playing in movie theaters to playing on the radio to studying in France with Nadia Boulanger and the organist Henri Marchal coming back here, being the organist and composer and arranger on Arthur Godfrey show for 22 years, and in the late 60s re resumed film accompaniment. Uh, uh, and then was the uh, house organist at the Carnegie Hall Cinema, uh, which is a, a repertory cinema. You can Google what that is if you don't know what a repertory cinema is. And I went to the, 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 rep the Carnegie Hall Cinema. I met Lee and told him what I was interested in. He and I became friends. He became a friend and a mentor to me. Um, it may have been because he was in his in his seventies and had more time than everybody else did, who was busy trying to hustle and make make make, make a living. Um, but he was this nice old gentleman from Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, I told him I was going to play for a Fairbanks picture the following in a week or two, and then when I came back to visit him again, he he handed me a piece of his own music, uh, his own manuscript to borrow uh, a theme to use for the show, and. And so that's, that's kind of, uh, that's how I got started. Uh, I was playing for Bill Everson's classes. Uh, in addition to Bob Sklar's class, uh, Everson heard that I was doing this and was really behind it and had the department buy a piano. Um, and and uh, so I, I was now, I mean, it was like silent film accompaniment boot camp. I was playing for one, two, or three features a week uh, in my, especially my junior and senior years. Uh, and so I would get to play for stuff, and I would talk to Lee and tell him what I had tried, what worked, what didn't work, and he would, or in preparation for something, I would, I would ask, what do I do here, what do I do there, and try to um, 
absorb his philosophy of, of scoring. And, and over the years, I've continued to try to connect with people who used to do this. Um, and, and not only with film accompaniment, but, but also uh, film curators and film historians who were, who were doing what I'm doing. So uh, that's how I got started. Uh, my, the, my, my joke about it is that I got into it for the same reason that most young guys get into it, is that it's a great way to meet girls. <laughs> Is it uh, really? No. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the basketball team, lady, lady, rock and lady. rock and yeah, rock and roll drummers, uh, basketball squad in in, in in college, and uh, no, not at all. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm still mystified as to why I thought this would be a good idea for me to get up in front of a large group of people and play. But I think. Uh, I didn't, I didn't feel the joy that Maki experienced, but I think at least the relief that people weren't really paying attention to me. Uh, and, and it was, I think, um, uh, I think it was after my first year that I was playing, I, I went to Cinecon, and I remember that it was in Davenport, Iowa, and I played at, at, at the Cinecon there, and that's where I, uh, uh, and I, I play for at least one or two things that John heard, and he's he's still speaking to me. So, uh, but I was really, 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 really weirded out by the people I met. Uh, uh, besides John, though, John was so, John was cool. But the film collectors and the people you meet at, at these film conventions. Um, it's an odd group. It's an odd group. It's a very nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, That's the nicest way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but uh, yeah, it was it was out of a desire to help these films not die in front of film students every week and maybe a secret wish to that I, I had having grown up listening to Bill Perry on public television wanted to give this a try myself. Right. Yeah. You, you mentioned a name that's near and dear to my heart and that's Stu Oderman. Um, I am yeah. I got into this because of Stu. Um, I went to my first Cinecon. I was, it was the summer before my senior year in college. It was 1974 and uh, they played Woman in the Moon and Stu played it, and when it was, oh, and I was just mesmerized, and when it was over, I don't remember who I was sitting next to, I turned to whoever was next to me, and I said, I don't know how he does that, I'm going to learn to do that. Yeah. That's what started, it was because of Stu. Stu yeah, was he's a and great then, guy, he passed away a few years ago, and his, yeah. his, his philosophy of film scoring and mine were a little different, um, but we got along great, you know, there was a series at MoMA in 2000 where, we were, where they ran only silent film for about five or six months and we would cross paths in the booth and you know we would tip each other off um about uh different different films i just lost something here okay um and we we, we would just which is you know he was he was my jewish uncle in the business oh. <laughs> and last but not least uh, andrew yes get into this Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, John, for organizing this. This is really great to, to see, see all these friends again. Um, so I guess I came to both music and film far later than anybody else on the panel, it sounds like. Uh, you know, my family was not musical. I didn't start piano until I was 13, which, you know, is quite late. Um, and when it comes to silent film, I mean, I always have loved film. I, I worked a lot in theater and, and I... I, I, you know, have a very visual sense, but I don't think it was until I moved to Washington that I really, you know, my friend Maurice Saylor, who's also a composer and who founded the Snark Ensemble with me, really kind of got to work on me and really, you know, showed me the variety of silent film and, and how it could be musical. And I think about like getting, kind of getting started in it and how different threads of your life come together in interesting ways. Uh, my undergraduate school was Butler in Indianapolis and the Butler Ballet is a pretty big uh, part of that school. And so my, one of my summer jobs was playing ballet classes. Well, I'd never done that before. Um, so, you know, the first class that I, I talked to the teacher beforehand and, and the teacher suggested some music I could bring in. And so I brought in some music and, and then, you know, I very quickly found out that, that the music I brought, the quote, real legitimate music wasn't matching up with what the dancers were doing because dancers count in eight and the music doesn't always go in eight. And like all of a sudden I'm off kilter and the dancers are, so I put the music aside and I just said, I'll try it myself. But, you know, I had zero uh, training in improvisation. 
I mean, I never had a class in it, never. Ha- I, so I have no idea how I would did it. I just, I guess I did it. I was in the ballet class and well, let's just you know, do it. Um, but it was very instructive for me because I learned about, you know, rounding off phrases and how to, to work with different um, uh, styles. It was, it was really helpful. And I've since found a lot of folks who do this have also been dance accompanists. Uh, so then I guess the, the start, Phil, Philip, yeah, <laughs> uh, Stephen Horn, I know, uh, does a lot of dance yeah, accompanying. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, John Sweeney. John Sweeney, yeah. So I, I, when I first, uh, so then, you know, I, I had a friend who was a composer, sometimes played at the National Gallery of Art, and, and I remember saying some, something dumb like, oh, that sounds like that would be fun, you know, and... Then there was a date when they had a film and, I, and she couldn't do it. And so she, you know, gave my name to Peggy Parsons, the head of the film program there. And uh, on the program were two films, uh, Shoulder Arms of Chaplin and a Belgian film, Maudit Soit la Guerre, May War Be Damned. And so it's a double a sort of World War I theme. And I was able to see a screener of both of those films in advance. Um, and again, another thread coming through in my life. So French happened to be the language that I studied in school and I kind of kept up with it. So I got to the gallery and it was the day in spring when you move the clocks forward. And at the National Gallery, they used to do, a translator would come in and translate the intertitles over a microphone, right? And then you'd have to kind of like, you know, play down. So the lady didn't move her clock. So she wasn't there. Right, so everybody's kind of flipping out and what are we gonna do? And, and I, I'm just like, well, I saw the film and I know the French, could I translate? You could do that? <laughs> and I said, I, sure, I guess. So I put a lapel mic on so I, you know, I'm accompanying the film and then translating the intertitles. <laughs> wow. Good start, good start. <laughs> Did you cook as well? Uh, uh, right. I had a little an omelet going on the side. <laughs> no, it was, it was and, I, and I love, you know, and I think like to echo what Machia said, I, I think that, so my training, I got a doctorate in composition from Indiana University, uh, you know, trained in the sort of classical uh, uh, tradition, and I teach at Catholic University in D.C., so that's my, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor teaching theory and composition, and I perform, you know, I have a you know, I work as a chamber musician and accompanist, you know, uh, all of the classical stuff. But I have to say that I just, I love silent film accompaniment like nothing else. And, and I think part of that is you, I, I often say, and I'm sure others, you probably feel the same way. Like sometimes I just forget that I'm playing for a film because you know, I'm so connected with the story and what's happening that I literally sort of forget that I'm doing it. And, and of course you want the audience to forget it as well. Right? You want them to be so, you know, sort of, you know, have that joint experience. But I love the energy that an audience can bring. And I love the way film audiences will say stuff to the screen. And, and like in the concert world, you don't do that, right? You know, you don't dare sneeze or, or you know, you never clap between movements, you know, never mind if they did that in the period of Beethoven, et cetera. So I, I felt there was a freedom to that and this just kind of emotional circuit that went between the screen and myself and that it's really it's magical. So I, I what can I say? I mean I, I love doing all things in music, but this is really special. How I mean, early on how early on were you playing for films when you showed up at Slapstickon and Philip and I <laughs> grabbed you because we were dying <laughs> playing for <laughs> Snooky Snooky the uh, Human C eight Eight, 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 I know. Oh eight, my eight, God. eight films in a row, and we're dying. Maybe oh, you, you do this? You do yeah. this? Yeah. Oh, good. We don't care yeah. if you stink. Yeah, yeah. We need a break. Yeah, yeah it it's was so great. true. I mean, like that, like Slapstickon, like, they, you know, have happy memory, right? But it's just, it kills well. you to play. <laughs> it was, I mean, when <laughs> to it was. Play just, so many comedies in a row. Yeah. Oh, but wow. when, when it was just <laughs> me, when, when it was just me and Philip, it was just grueling to sit through, to do 90 minutes of, of one reelers. And yeah. so yeah. we were happy that you, you, you were, there was a new blood, so to speak, yes, yes. that we could throw into the mix. I remember you had a wonderful phrase, Philip. Uh, not, I mean, uh, Ben, about like by day three, you have you start having the musical dry heaves. Yes. <laughs> no. yes. Well, the, the yeah. problem is, is we're you just trying. like what else? What else can I? What else can I do? I have, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> because my we idea of on. hell is, is a weekend of one one and two real comedy short playing. <laughs> that's, that's why I never attended the Lapsicon. I just couldn't couldn't take it. It's demanding. But, yeah. Yeah. It's nothing but comedy, yeah. all right? The films are there. They're already set. They're supposed to be funny. 
The problem is we have to make funny. Yeah. We have to make oh, yeah. funny all the time yeah. to compliment them. But this is, that's where we came up with the idea that we that we then brought over to Mostly Lost, where instead of one person playing a show and then you take the next show, we do this round robin thing. And even though we were playing every show by rotating on and off the piano bench at the end of every short, it kept our sanity mostly. Absolutely. And Absolutely. For, those who, for those who haven't been to Mostly Lost, Andrew, Philip, and Ben are the three primary companies for that. Um, and, and you have to see this. It is... It is hour upon hour of unidentified film fragments, nearly always silenced. And, and as Ben says, they're literally, you watch them and they're like rotating on and off the, the bench, playing stuff that nobody knows what it is. It's, there's often no coherent story to it. And, and, and they make it work. It's, and we, we, we repay them by letting each of them do a, a big show in the evening, you know, with a, with a pre-announced feature film, but but my, my my hats off to you because it's uh, it's pretty astonishing watching how you have yeah. to I was just and yeah. we, also, we also have kind of fact is the the three of us up front. Sometimes we get people really crowding around us in the row behind us because we act as kind of a Greek chorus <laughs> uh, because you know we've got the list of films or you know somebody says. You know, it says next one, Hall Room Boys, number 86. And, you know, and everybody's part yeah. it, it, it isn't so, you know, it isn't, it isn't so much a Greek chorus as it is our own private uh, MST3K yes. down by the piano. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we only need, we just need a silhouette of Crow T Robot and a couple of other <laughs> puppets and you'd have the same, the same thing going on. Yeah. 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 That, that oh, leads me, I'm going to diverge. We spent a lot of time on, on, on origins, which is fascinating. And I think everyone enjoys here. I want to diverge though, because this leads into a good topic. You know, I think most people on this call probably are aware of this, but many times when, when any of us go in to play for a film, you know, at, at times, of course, we, you've got a whole, you can screen the film. You know, I mean, I've seen, you know, Philip has written entire orchestral scores for films. But a lot of times at these events, like mostly Lost, Cinecon, you know, Cinefest, Cinevent, we've never seen the films before. And, you know, you were just, I mean, usually the extent of the research, I get, I get the AFI you know, catalog, the one paragraph summary, and I'll have it there, the kind of, okay, what's going to happen next? But but you have no idea. What's that experience like? like Maki, you've been very quiet for a while. What, what's, what's that experience like? I mean, is it is it terrifying or is it just like playing anything else? So um, I have only played at Cinefest in terms of, you know, this festival setting where, you know, you don't get to see the films beforehand. And actually, I think I was subbing for you, John, when I first got, you know, the job to play there. So it was uh, Philip, uh, Gabriel, and me. And I had no idea. I met Gabriel and Philip the year before at the Pordenone. I was one of the masterclass students. So, you know, both of them are my teachers. And then, um, so they invited me to, <laughs> of all the people, sub for you, John. And I was like, oh, fish out of water. I had no idea. And I just got this, you know, list of films, but I, it didn't mean anything to me. So I arrived the night before the first day of the festival, and Philip summoned us, the three of us. And so Philip kind of walked me through. So he's he just had this program in front of us. So... Do you, Makia, do you have? Do you know any of the films? Do you do you want? Is there anything you wanna in a play? And I, was, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that actually. <laughs> well, I remember being a little cruel because I really didn't want to play Mr. West in the Land of the Bulls. Yeah, and oh, so I, oh I got that. Did you yes, give that to her? Yes. yes. That's well, I, I, harassment. I, 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 I enjoyed I it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Philip, you know, kind of scared me a little bit, but uh, <laughs> I oh, happened to have. Yeah, <laughs> I, I learned that. But 
I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. No, no, no. It, it was fun. And I was glad, you know, Philip and Gabriel were there to kind of hold my hands. And, uh, yeah, so they gave me, you know, whatever films, you know, that, you know, they thought, you know, that were good for me or they didn't want to play. <laughs> and <laughs> Philip also sat with me and just kind of, you know, went, went over the program with me and, and this one paragraph synopsis or sometimes it's, it wasn't even a synopsis but Philip kind of told me so if, if I were you um, this is set in a certain period of time so I would you know prepare myself to play this, uh, this kind of music or um, this seems to be a, a melodrama so you know, be prepared to you know play something sappier you know so he gave me the crash course on how to prepare to play cold and yeah that was my very first time having to do this and I actually both Philip and Gabriel I think they sat behind me whenever I was playing and they would give me comments after I played so I, I it was like I was getting paid to take this best master classes from two of the best <laughs> yeah accompanists uh, in the world so that was how I got thrown into this and I got to play at Cinefest a few more times uh, until it, you know, sadly closed back in 2015. And yeah, the more I did it, I started to, you know, get a hang of it. So actually this, thanks to Cinefest, I got trained. So now I don't get scared. I feel confident I can come up with something. <laughs> so yeah, but if I didn't have the Cinefest you know, training boot camp experience, I don't know how I could have trained myself. <laughs> Cinefest was a great training ground for that because that was one yeah. first, more than any of the other festivals where it was the, their, their whole mode of op operation was we run it if it's rare. Right. And so many times it'd be like the first screening in 80 years. Yeah, couldn't get a when you're ready, I'll, I'll look and I remember there was a uh, there was um, it was a Buck Jones Western. I had a play and it had Czech inner titles. And unlike Andrew, I was not going to translate Czech <laughs> while playing. And I remember it was yeah, Leonard yeah. Moulton who said right before the screening, he said, and I said, well, I don't know anything about it. It's going to check in the titles. And Leonard said, John, it's a Western. The good guys have white hats. The bad guys have black hats. What? Do you need a libretto? And, and he was right. Good point. Yeah. I, I got the Czech intertitle films at Cinefest as well. And so I actually got two Czech intertitle films for whatever reason that year. And the first one was absolutely, uh, really, there's no way anyone could have, you know, understood what was going on in the film. So I was confused, audience was confused, and that was a disaster. So for my second check in your title film, I think they found the English, uh, the English version with a red from somewhere. So Leonard Maltin himself was to read that along with the film as I was accompanying. So I thought, okay, good. So this time at least we will know what was going on in the film. But then it was a different edi edition of the libretto yeah. Leonard got. So like maybe 20 minutes into the film, he got lost and he stopped the reading. And again, I was left to just try to figure out what's going on, but it's all checked. So. <laughs> I guess we ought to we ought to talk really quickly because we're we're thrown into the soup, as it were. And when we're thrown into the soup, and if it's either really bad or really unprepared soup, if anybody has anything to say about that, because we've all had it, uh, where you just go in and maybe you're expecting something. You know, the label says it, and then it turns out to be as Machia said something and now for something completely different <laughs> well that's happened to me yeah yeah well i mean i think that you have to rely on your own ability to improvise i yeah. mean i'm just i mean frederick i was just curious because i've never met you how did you start getting into doing improvisation i got started with improvisation because that was the only way to accompany a movie when i got started uh. it, it, this was like 2002 the, the YouTube didn't exist in the way it does today. That back then it was just cat videos. Nowadays there's <laughs> still cat videos. Cat videos, it's <laughs> cat, cat videos and uploads yeah. of bootleg Keaton films. Yeah. Right, right. But, but now just about every silent movie ever issued on DVD or um, VHS is on YouTube, so I can prepare. Back then it was impossible, so I had to um, improvise every single movie. 
that I um, accompanied. There was no way to see it in advance. So I, you know, yeah. trial by fire. Yeah. 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 I, I, the, 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 I, I, sometimes you have to, you, you, with it, if you don't get a chance to screen a film ahead of time, you have to shift gears. I was doing a series at MoMA a bunch of years ago. It's the first time I ever played for I Was Born, but I didn't know anything about Ozu. But <laughs> prior to that film, I had played for a few other Japanese films where were these dark, sad dramas. Um, uh, I can't think of the name of it. It's it's another. It's a film. One of them was a film made by the guy who did um, uh, Page of Madness, I think, oh. or something. Oh, but there are these dark. Yeah. yeah. So these really dark, sad things. Yeah. And so uh, I was born, but begins. And I'm playing in a slow minor key. <laughs> and after three minutes, I'm like, Oh, this is a Hal Roach comedy in yeah, Japan. Exactly. <laughs> and I just like, and I just modulated into a major key and like totally shifted. But you know. You, yeah, you have to sort of stay open to your own impulses and sense the vibe in the room and sense what's yeah, happening cool. on screen and be willing to go, oh, I'm wrong about this and just shift. Right. Well, I have to say, oh, oh sorry, Andrew. No, sorry. I was going to say, like, I, you know, to, like, like Mark, yeah, I did the master classes at Porto Nene. And so oh. I'm giving, you know, all credit to Philip and his colleagues mm -hmm. who were just such great teachers. I mean, really, mm -hmm. you and, and Neil Brand and, and, and all the uh, Donald Sos and all those folks. I mean, it was really a wonderful week because each of them took a day and kind of led the class and yeah. talked about exactly that. Like, how do you read a film, right? Like, how do you, like, and, and I know that, it, you know, like, I didn't see the films. Janice Meredith was the film that I did. The, oh, the yeah. Marion Davies, oh right? I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 Well, oh. I, you know, but I, I love Marion Davies. Anyway, um, so I, I, I felt like, uh, you know, that was so important to me about how to read a film and how to, you know, sort of like approaches you can take and, and how to anticipate. And I remember one of the days of the master class, they, I forget if I was the pianist doing it, but the, the Patsy, speaking of Marion Davies, it mm. begins with this scene and whoever's day it was, might have been, maybe it was your day, I don't remember, Philip, but but they the opening scene of the film, right, the, the, the family's eating dinner, and then you see a finger press a doorbell, right? And then of course, any pianist is gonna go ding or some kind of, and then the family's still eating and then you cut back to the finger again and it presses the finger but then the doorbell's broken damn you, you know? <laughs> a deliberate trick on the accompanist yeah. <laughs> so, it, so it, there's always those moments like how do you retreat from that you just kind of keep well you, you can't i mean that was that was there's a there's a film called the green goddess with uh, the silent film version of it and there's a mo usually the trope is that if somebody puts a record on, there's a close-up of the label so you know what right. the hell you're playing. Or if somebody sits at the piano, they, they, there's a close-up of the sheet music. Well, he's got everybody captured, in, 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 the lead character has everybody captured in his house. And he's got them gathered in the parlor. He walks over to the Victrola, puts a record on. I'm like, where's the close-up? Nothing. Yeah. Cranks it up, puts the yeah. needle on, uh, nothing. Uh, uh, uh. And he's nodding like he's listening to the music and he's looking at the other people for their reaction. And I'm playing, I don't know what the hell it is. And then he's, in the title, he says, you know what that is? And they go, what? And he says, the funeral march for marionette. <laughs> oh, jeez. You do a, one of those sounds. So <laughs> I, I remember talk, telling this to Philip, who said, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to, you said that you were going to play, be playing for this, I think, at Port Aroni or something. I said, Philip, when he puts on the record, <laughs> <laughs> play the funeral march for marionette, and even if the, if you if people know you're playing for the film Colt, they'll think you're a genius. Yeah, I know it, it happens all the time, uh, and it's all it's things like that. If there is a if there's a record player, if there's a piano really square yeah. in the scene, yeah. if yeah. there's a radio, a radio is yeah. yeah. play. Yes. If there's something coming, but. But so it's something don't it, you know? Uh, there's another Marion Davies costume picture. It's, it's something of New York, where she goes and she 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 goes and she meets Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison is showing her his new invention, the photograph. Well, we all know that Thomas Edison sang "Mary Had a Little Lamb" into the phonograph. So I'm playing "Mary Had a Little Lamb," and he says that was Yankee Doodle Dandy. I'm like, <laughs> no, I mean Yankee Doodle. He says Yankee Doodle. I'm like. Dudes, it was only ten years ago. We all know that it's Mary had a l okay. So sometimes they trip you up and you can't you can't right. trust the no film. Right. Well can I add something to that? Yeah. yeah. Um so many years ago at Cinecon, 
Um, Joe Oransky arranged for a rare, recently discovered uh, movie to be shown. It was called Betty. And um, I was commissioned to accompany it. And they told me this in advance. Usually at Cinecon, you, you just you, you find out at the last minute what you're accompanying and you cannot prepare. But for this, Joe wanted me to prepare. And I love preparing. And the, the movie was originally issued with a Vitaphone soundtrack, but the Vitaphone soundtrack was missing for all but the very last reel. And I had to prepare an accompaniment for all the preceding reels. Well, Joe had an original cue sheet. Mm. As you know, cue sheets were issued by third-hand party companies um, to help the accompanist accompany the film. So he sent me that, and I, it's precisely timed, so I knew exactly what to play. Well, there's a scene where in the cue sheet it says, and now she sits down to play the piano, and it lists the song I'm to play. It's called, it was called Baltimore by Jimmy McHugh. So I, I didn't have the sheet music, but I at great expense found it on eBay and spent hundreds of dollars to get this rare piece of sheet music. And here comes the scene and I'm about to play the piano. And then you see, she sits at the piano and there's the sheet music. And it's prominently displayed as big full on close up of the sheet music cover. And it's a totally different song. So, <laughs> oh, well, you know, there's yeah, I'd wasted all that time and money on yeah. for nothing. There's, there's an example. It, it's one of the two. Um, okay, everybody's got to help me out here because, you know, think films run together. The two films that I get mixed up of the mills are uh, Don't T Change Your Husband and Why Change, Why your, change wife. your Wife. Because they have the same title. They, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, this is the one. Uh, which one is the one? I think it's Don't Change Your Husband with uh, Swanson, Tommy Mayen, Bebe Daniels. Um, with the, it has the sofa which converts into a phonograph. Does anybody remember this? I, I, I know that there's one of those why don't you do this uh, films like that that has Hindustan in it. Yeah, yeah it has yeah, Hindustan. That's I played for that a few years ago. I that's why I remember. I have to look it up. Oh. Yeah, well, this is a funny thing is that it's one of the few films because um, Swanson's trying to get Mayan to be high cultured. And she shows him the record that she wants him to listen to, which is uh, it's The Dying Poet by yes. the Victor Concert Orchestra. Right. Okay? It's about the only time you ever see a labeled record with the actual tune and artist on it. <clears throat> okay? Now, when a uh, man goes over to B.B. Daniels' house, or his flat, and she has this incredible sofa, the Davenport, one side opens up into a bar, and the other side. <laughs> nice. Do you remember? Do you remember that? It opens no. up a set of drinks. I was I was just trying to read the sheet music I had in front of me. I don't... Okay. <laughs> well, one side opens up with drinks and a decanter saying "forbidden fruit." Okay. Oh yeah. And then the other side is the phonograph with Hindustan played by Joseph C. Smith Orchestra. Now. And in the film, B.B. Daniels is really just rocking out to it. Yeah. And for my class, when we did this, I said, I didn't play Hindustan this way <laughs> for, the, for the public screening. You want to hear what Joseph C. Smith's version of Hindustan sounds like? And I played, them, played it for them. You can hear it on the National Group Box. It's about the stodgiest piece you've ever heard. I, yep. I did the same oh, thing. I found the recording and said, no, no, I have to change it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it, you can't rock out. To yeah. <laughs> it's very straight lace, very bump, 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 bump. Yeah. Oh, God. And it's slow and it's like a march. And yeah. it's not, it's not a jazz baby song at all. No, 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 no. Uh, it's where you have to improve upon it. So, um, I don't know why it was, you know, even stuck in. Yeah. Well, this is, I, I call it the needle drop of doom. When you're, when you're playing a film you've never seen, you see going, they're going to drop the needle. Like, oh no, they're going to show the label and I'm not going to know what it is. And then you see, and there's a label, except the label's doing this. So you're, you're trying to read what's on the label and then trying to figure out what the tune is. But the, the one that really got me, and I think, Frederick, I think you were probably there. Philip, maybe this is, you were there as well. A number of years ago at Cinecon, they ran John Ford's Upstage. 
And um, and there's I mean, it was this was like the, the big premiere, you know, it had been found in the New Zealand film archive. Nobody had seen the film. That's big, big event. And there's a scene where the guy who he's made it kind of he's, he's being called to the big stage now and he's leaving the boarding house where all the actors are. And he's walked down the stairs and someone begins playing a piano. This is sort of their farewell party. And I'm thinking, well, what would they be playing as he's walking down the, you know, downstairs? And I can't, I'm trying to read the keys. And I think, well, I'll bet they're playing for he's a jolly good fellow. So I mean, but dun da 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 and he comes down. And then they show the sheet music and it's all Lang Syne. <laughs> Except well, that's the other age, yes. the jolly good fellow. I have for yeah. jolly good fellow. So then you're trying to uh, turn it into oh, old Lang Syne. Yeah. While you're playing, <laughs> da -da -da -da, and it's sort of, <laughs> you know, it's just. <laughs> and I, I bet you got there, but you know, it's like. But you you you, you develop a language, language of musical vocabulary, and you just try to make it work. I remember. Um, Joe, I mentioned Joe Ransky again, he used to do a series at the Donnell Library called Meet the Music Makers and it had different accompanists come in and talk about their work. And I remember that you had Joe, uh, Dave Knutson, who's an organist who passed by a few years ago, came and he talked about meeting a woman who had been a piano player in movie theaters in the silent film era. And she said, the story I remember is she, she said that, you know, on Monday she would walk up to the theater and Monday was when the new film had started, and she'd look at the lobby cards and some of the stills and the poster, and she'd get a pretty basic idea of what the film was about. And by the second or third show, she had her score together. But they they, they play the first show show cold the same way a lot of, a lot of times, even back in the twenties. Yeah. Well, you know, I I don't know if Andrew and Machia met, remember this when you know when I was talking at Fordnone, one of the things, uh, the session I do, I usually teach with John Sweeney because he likes to think of it as he's the good cop and I'm the bad cop. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it, it works very well uh, because we were both ballet accompanists. Ballet is a great training uh, because of rhythm. Right. And I used to, uh, in fact, when I was playing for ballet schools, I could, I could improvise in ballet schools and just do it because I knew how to do eight measure phrases. And in fact, I studied for my qualifying exams I had Grout, Grout's history of uh, medieval music on the music desk as I was playing uh, Grand Jetés and Ronde de Jambes, and I could improvise without thinking. But um, one of the things I said in the class was you get all the information you can beforehand from the program and whatever you have and from your experience, and then you read it like a racing form. Uh, you know, if it's a German film, okay, well, what have you had of German films? Well, they're not usually... Sorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Toilets. They're not usually very quickly cut, all right? So the editing style is going to give you a lot of space usually to work with. Um, right. If there's a young girl and an old man, the old man is a sexual predator on the young girl. That's rule number one in German films, okay? <laughs> um, it, it always happens. Um, then you look at uh, what company, uh, then you, if you know the company, then you figure, okay, this is a big company or a small company. How much, that means that it's not gonna have a lot of money in it, it's gonna look cheap. Um, and if you know any of the directors, I mean, like with Janice Meredith, for instance, Andrew, okay? Yeah. If you want to, I'm looking at it and I'm going like, oh, okay, it's Marion Davies, it's Cosmopolitan, tons of money, right? Tons and tons and tons of money, and a lot of Marion Davies, mm -hmm. a lot of <laughs> Marion Davies. Yeah. yeah, not so much, not so, not a lot, not a lot of story, but a lot of Marion Davies in costumes. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And how Forrest long? Gumpian. Then you look at the length. Ten reels. That's an effing lot of Marion Davies. And then you look at the director, E. Mason Hopper. Hopper yeah. And um, there's a good reason you don't see much of E. Mason Hopper. <laughs> because the yeah, best word yeah. you can describe Hopper's work is erratic. <laughs> and, you can, and, and that basically what you do is, okay, it's a revolutionary war or you know, 18th century drama. Lots of money on the screen, directed by a man who, from all accounts, and I think this is behind the uh, Mask of Innocence, 
uh, was evidently a better cook than a director. <laughs> so you just have to be prepared for anything. Yeah. Right. Not necessarily a lot of speed or entertainment. Right. And um, <laughs> you you just keep keep the style plastic enough. I think that's you know what Ben was also saying, and mm -hmm. you, you keep it so that if you get into one spot and you suddenly have to round the corner because you're wrong, um, well, then you can do it because the only people who really know, unless it's he's a jolly good fellow and all by design, but if you do it swiftly enough, it, people will be thinking way ahead anyway. And they're watching the movie anyway, so, you know. <laughs> the only people who know is, is you. And, yeah. Uh, yes. So no, I want to. I want to. I want to break in here. Um, we're gonna in a, in a few minutes. I want to switch over to do some Q and A. And I would say, in fact, uh, th those who are viewing um, the uh, and I noticed Rena just corrected me. I said upstage. She's right. It's upstream, upstream. Was the John Ford film, not upstage. Um, the um, people who can, if you want to start putting questions into the chat box, we'll get to those shortly. But I want to ask people to, to uh, not, I don't mean to diverge this more serious note, but, you know, obviously we've been, most of us have been shut down now for over five months uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm curious, wh what are people doing in terms of, of music and films? Are you doing, trying to do studio work? Ben, I know I'd like you to say a few well, words. <laughs> well, so I, ne I never shut down. But Let's, let's start. Let's start with Ben because I want to okay. hear what people are doing and give others ideas of things we can do. Because I think we're going to be doing this for a while longer. We're going to be doing this for the rest of the year and on on into the <laughs> and it's into next year. Um, I I had just come back from playing a weekend of films in Beatrice, Nebraska, uh, and uh, you know over forty eight hours watched every gig I had for the next few months. Uh, like dominoes go and I I have always had this idea of finding a way to live stream a musical a score for a silent film years ago I was trying to figure out a way to do this uh, so that if you didn't you know if you're watching something on TCM and didn't want to hear that score uh, but there are issues with being the, the not only latency you'd be every every cable channel has a different you'll be off by a bunch of seconds and what didn't work um, between that and just, um, I've just been really interested in whatever is coming up next in terms of the technology. And so I, uh, I gradually had, I actually, when I had the idea, I already had all the pieces. Uh, I had a YouTube channel that had been approved for live streaming. I had um, iPhone tripod mounts and lenses and lavaliers and uh, done some, some streaming tests. And so I created this this thing that has been going on for 23 weeks now called the Silent Comedy Watch Party. Um, live, you know, the idea being, I, I, I initially didn't, until March of this year, thought I, I did not want to replicate uh, the live, the live uh, experience of live music because I want people to go to the theater. And then, um, and then I decided to do the, the show, and I was actually I was going to yank yank the show after the first show just because my my idea my initiative was that this be a live experience that we all share. And my wife smartly said, "No, there's nowhere else for anybody to go right now." And so we left the show up, and we've been doing this every week. Um, I've I've just kept finding different ways to make the show look better, find a way to, instead of projecting the films on a wall and shooting them that way, to feed it straight through my, my, uh, my MacBook. Um, what's, been, what's, been really, what's been really touching about it is, is uh, the response we've gotten. Um, because nobody can go to a cinema right now, uh, anything that, that's, that, 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 that is uh, like a live experience that we can all share is just meant so much more to people. Um, and the other nice thing that is, has been the cooperation that we've had reaching out to uh, distributors uh, like Kino and, and, and Lobster and other places as well as I see Michael Aus is on, on here and thank you Michael. For those of you who don't know who Michael is, Michael under, under uh, T. Guinan, like as in Texas Guinan on eBay, uh, has produced and several DVDs of films 
with comedians like Lyons and Moran and uh, uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Drew. Uh, and like, like a lot of people has done, has gotten files from the Library of Congress. And so the Lyons and Moran comedy that we showed on the watch party a couple of weeks ago was something <coughs> that we screened thanks to Michael. Uh, so it's been a mix of collectors and distributors. But the idea was uh, finding a way to replicate what, what happened, the live experience by live streaming it. And I, you know, with the watch party, I leave it up because there are people watching in Australia and Japan where it's four o'clock in the morning. But when I, I'm now doing shows for arts, art house cinemas. Um, I've done a few for the Cinema Arts Center, one for the Cleveland Cinematheque, and I've got a few coming up next month. But the idea is um, the way people are doing theater or a friend of mine is doing a one-man show out of his apartment actually two different shows where you send people an unlisted link and um, the the theater does the box office ticketing and it's 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 been a lot of it's been a lot of fun i i don't do anything i mean this, this, i don't do anything else this is this is the other comment i get up from people when they meet me they say what well, yes but what do you really do no this <laughs> is what i really you're at my day job um, so i had to figure out a way to to uh, retool and, ma and make this make this happen. So what I'm what I'm doing is, uh, I'm I'm doing the same thing, but out of my living room <laughs> with with iPhones and wires and spaghetti all over the place. <laughs> Are others doing uh, some interesting projects, to, you know, related to music and film? So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so uh, I've oh, yeah. been doing a couple of things this summer. So one thing that I started back in April was. Uh, doing a daily series on YouTube. I do a short, uh, under two minute improvisation, uh, and then I pair it with either existing footage that I compile, some films that I shoot myself, or photo slideshows. And uh, I do it every day, so tonight will be the 129th installment. Uh, I've right. done this every day since April 16th. The series is called Sparklers on YouTube. I'll send the, I'll put the URL in the chat. Um, and then, uh, like Ben, I've jumped into the streaming game. Uh, I've done a couple of live streams now uh, from right here in my uh, house. Um, I did a show a couple weeks ago with the Library of Congress paper print films. Um, and then uh, David Callett uh, joined me as a guest last week. And then this coming Wednesday, I'm doing a show at 8 p.m. Uh, with uh, featuring Charlie's aunt with Sid Chaplin and maybe a couple of other little treats. So, uh, and I got to say, you know, as Ben has experienced, right, the tech is difficult. You know, it's it's, oh, it's <laughs> hard to do. It's, it is a lot. Of, yeah, it's difficult because not only are you hosting a show, accompanying it, but you're also the television technical director, yeah. and sometimes uh, accent on the word technical because you're dealing. You're looking. I'll glance over and I'll see error messages come up or I'll find out that the stream has been yanked. That only happened once. Um, uh, but there's, there's always things that you're, you're juggling. So there's this other mindset you have to be uh, uh, doing at the, at the, you know, you're doing your own tech support while also accompanying a film. But it's wonderful, as you say, like yeah. the audience is appreciative and it's great to yeah. share, even though you can't see them, you just, it's, you know that they're there and that's just a wonderful way to share. Yeah, it's Here it's been comes. really great, and there's a couple of you know the the software that Andrew is using is called OBS Studio, OBS Studio and that's yeah. it's 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 uh, free, it's open source, it's a little the the interface is really meant like if you're a 24 year old gamer, you'll have no trouble picking it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm using one that's Not built me, for man. yeah, I'm using one called Mimo Live, M I M O meaning multi in multi out. It's Mac mainly made. It's just for Mac. Uh, it's developed by a couple of brothers in, in Germany, um, but they're constantly fixing bugs and updating it. It is a slight cost to it, but those two options are are really good. And in, and we're both, I don't know if you've hit anything, Andrew, but the trick mm -hmm. is is uh, YouTube and copyright stuff that's that's not necessarily uh, the truth. Um, yeah. But, not you know, just dealing, dealing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just dealing with the content ID uh, f digital fingerprinting system that they have set up. And just the different the different aspects of that, but it's it's a way to connect with an audience, um, and yeah. to as close as it's really the you know by doing it live, it's the closest you can get to the experience for an audience member uh, to the experience of uh, uh, attending a silent film show. I'm going to uh, I'm going to break in and put in a plug um, for obviously Cinecon has been canceled this year, but um, uh, Stan Tavel has put together something that he calls a Cinecon line. 
Yeah, and, good. Um, uh, we've assembled a number of films. I contributed three films. Ben, you know two of those, because two of those were two we intended for DVD release, which is Ticket <laughs> Ghost and uh, um, uh, Lorraine of the Lions. Oh, but yeah. I also just finished uh, putting together, I had to do a lot of digital editing and did a new score for The Fourth Commandment, which is a 1926 Emory Johnson film with Bell Bennett. Quite rare, and it's from a very rare show at home print. Uh, that appears to be the only extant print. So LOC scanned it a while back, and so I've just finished scoring that. And that's going to be run. That's going to be the opening night film. But the Cinecon they're doing, I believe, it's the Thursday, Friday, Saturday before Labor Day weekend. From oh, great. I think it's three mm -hmm. to seven Pacific time. So you know what is that? Six to nine, six to ten. Six to um, uh, on uh, the East Coast. Uh, so and they're running a number of films. And again, uh, Frederick, you've done some scores for that. Yeah. Um, I did three, people, Jeff I did three has scores. Donated films. I've donated films. Um, and so that's going to be an interesting program as well uh, as, as a way to try and you know, not replace Cinecon, but as an alternative uh, mm -hmm. to provide some online. You know, John, may I ask a question? I'm really curious. You're always very generous with your collection. You provide um, films for Niles to show and Cinecon. But how are you sharing these uh, films from your collection with Cinecon? Did you have to pay to have them digitally scanned? <clears throat> well, I was, I'm lucky because I was the, or I should say Cinecon was lucky because um, I was sort of the inaugural person who kicked off the Library of Congress, what they call the Silent Film Project, where they were borrowing films from private collectors, yeah. uh, you know, rare things, things mm -hmm. that they would look up that I provided all my films and they said, you have 84 films that aren't in any be off archive and so they borrowed and scanned all 84 of them and gave me digital scans so i just i gave stan taffel a list i said you know and he said you know i said do you want good or do you want rare and he said well i really like both I'm, oh well that makes it harder <laughs> but but uh, you know there were there were two or three that were i said were quite good films that i thought were quite rare one of them was the fourth commandment so i had the raw scan from L loc with still you know it's full frame so i have to get out the sprocket holes and it had flash titles and i mean i spent a fair amount of time cleaning up the video and then i, I have a i do it all digitally but it's uh, i have a fairly nice studio uh where i just you know i did a multi-track recording and um uh you know and put it together and uh, that's this will be the world premiere at cinecon so but you're right i mean cool. the, the, the films that aren't actually sitting behind me now because i'm sitting upstairs but the part of the vault I mean, many of these have been digitally scanned and I had access to them. Others doing things, think, well, how are people staying sane musically during? Uh, well, I mean, I have, I'm in the process. There's, there's a couple of things. I'm hoping to set up with a couple of friends of mine, something of a live stream um, for a couple of films, some shorts and features. Um, because they do a lot live podcast here in Rochester and they have the technical know-how and anybody who knows me knows that, well, I'm <laughs> not that happy about it. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe you're on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I had to teach all my class. Yeah. But I had two classes to teach after March break. Uh, via Zoom, including a film class, uh, which was really hard, let me tell you. Um, and it, the film class was hard, and the other class was the history of sound recording and the aesthetics of it. <laughs> and to do that adequately was nearly impossible. Um, Eastman has laid off all adjunct faculty, so I don't have any work. Hmm. Um, cinemas in New York State are closed so that uh, we can't even show films at the Eastman House. We were planning to mm. September mm -hmm. uh, because the whole museum has been remodeled. There, the Eastman House is also preparing to, po to put some films out digitally online. And I've been approached about doing those, uh, you know, with scores for them. Um, I can do some things from home, but I haven't had anything to do. Also, I had a bad bicycle accident, some of you may know, early in, well, it was late in May, and I haven't been really mobile for about three months. So it has kind of put my mind behind hand. 
I also have two films to do for Portanone. Um, uh, the way they're doing Portanone this year, I don't know if anybody else knows this, is they're going to have one feature and one short and one talk about for each day of the festival. Wow. And um, I've got my short uh, with, and a feature. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to, you know, release what they are. You know, I can't, it doesn't matter, except that I can tell you that the feature, which is an American feature, has Serbo-Croatian titles and no translation. Okay. Uh, okay. And um, I've asked for a translation, which they're trying to get, uh, from the, it was from the National Archive in Japan who did the restoration. Oh. Um, and I told them if I don't get a translation, it's going to be highly impressionistic uh, because uh, the story's rather convoluted. Um, so I'm doing those two films and uh, possibly, you know, a talk about and what I was going to, uh, well, because we're also supposed to do teaching classes. And I was going to do a short talk about the one real drama, you know, as a good teaching example for how to accompany, you know, because it's compact. Uh, the, the best of them, the American one reeler is a really beautiful, really beautiful thing just in itself. Uh, both dramas and some of the best one reel comedies that, uh, you know, that one or, you know, the best senates, for instance. All right, I'm, I'm gonna move on. I, I, I don't mean to cut you short, though. I want to, we, we're, we're running in the last 10 minutes, so I want to take a few of the questions that have with the questions coming in the chat. Let me read these, and I would say anyone who wants to take it, grab it. So the first one, if an on-screen character plays an instrument and the accompanist doesn't play for it, I assume it was because you didn't have a chance to prepare, or is there ever a philosophical reason the accompanists choose not to do this? Uh, I assume it means, like I said, where someone you see someone and they pick up and they, they play a flute or a clarinet or something, do you try and emulate it? And if you don't, is there a reason? Did it catch you by well, surprise? You just thought it didn't work? It's context. It, it's how long it is and how, you know, what the context is. You know, if it's uh, otherwise, you know, we're talking a little bit about, you know, with the doorbell, if we always ring the doorbell, it's the business of Mickey Mousing. You know, and so it's <clears throat> got to maintain a flow through a scene. So it depends upon the context. How important is it within the film? Because you don't want to draw attention to your accompaniment. Oh, they matched it really well. And sometimes the, 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 what they're playing isn't a joke. If somebody picks up a saxophone and plays, the joke is that this person is playing a saxophone because it, it was an instrument that was made, of, made fun of in the 20s because it was so new. But it isn't about what, what that person was playing uh, so you don't want to call attention to it if 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 that if it if it, if it as a, as a way to support what's happening on screen. It's kind of a case by case, I think. It, yeah. it's really it. it says, um, uh, if the original score exists and you have access to it, would you normally use it, or would you still create your own composition? Well, how many of us how many of us have played for Way Down East with the original score besides me and Andrew? Anybody else? Oh yeah. Oh. Well, I, I can tell you. Oh, I'm no. actually yeah. never hoping, again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank goodness the ice flow sequence music is missing. Yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. Oh man, what a I, what a stink! Uh, yeah. Uh, I yeah. can tell you, there's a critical edition of it coming out that I'm going to be seeing, oh. and I have to. I'm going over it. Yeah. I that score no is more. really. Yeah. Okay. I, I say no more, but I've uh, actually. I've got a hand in this, and I think if, I'm not going to make a critical judgment one way or the other. <laughs> well, yeah. That's that's one of those scores that has the the light motif, which you know it's it works like, in various things. But it's like every time you see you know the rustics, it's always old gray mare, and every yeah. single time. It's what, know, I, yeah, it's, it's what I yeah, it's what I call Peter. Uh, uh, it's what I call Peter and the Wolf scoring. Yeah. Anytime somebody shows up, somebody could have just died, but if the funny policeman shows up, you play the funny music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Frederick played Ken Frederick, and you played, you did, a, you did a program that I also did. We had Ben Burt doing the sound effects for Wings, and you played the original. I did my score for one show, and you did the original score for Wings. Right. And, um, you know, clearly Way Down East, one of the worst, least imaginative scores ever created. 
Um, but there were wonderful scores. Um, I mean, there weren't a lot of scores created in the 20s, only for roadshow versions yeah, of movies. Very, very few movies got that treatment. And some of the scores are, are really good, but none of them fit the prints that survive to today. So mm -hmm. you can't rely on an original score. Like at Niles, um, they scheduled the covered wagon. Well, I actually own the original score to that, and I was so excited. But the version they have at Niles is cut down to like one hour. The total score, score is for over two hours. And it was so confusing, I had no idea where I was. I just gave up well, and started improvising. The other thing is with the original scores, they're not meant for us. Not meant yeah. for solo yeah. piano. Well, no, they're, 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 they were they're never meant for an orchestra. And they yeah. were never enforced anyway, so the local conductors you know, did whatever well, they wanted. Uh, right. one, I did one original score for a British film called The Flag Lieutenant um, that was done by a British cinema conductor named Albert Casabon. And uh, it was the original score, but it didn't match the print quite, and I had to edit it. But I didn't want to do it with piano. So we did it with piano, violin, uh, because there was a you know I, a first violin part running across the top of the score, and drums basically like a tiny provincial cinema orchestra, and it worked. It's actually uh, Casabon did a good job with it, but a lot of these things don't work. Um, you know uh, I was very leery in doing I guess it was Chang with the original cue sheet. Because in one scene, it calls for the teddy bear's picnic. Okay. <laughs> because a bear is on screen? Am I, am I right? I'm just guessing. Well, here's the thing. I was told to do it. Told oh. to do it. And we did it with five players, I think. So I had to reconstruct all the cues. And by Godfrey, it wasn't too bad with... <laughs> Teddy Bear's Picnic. And it was a James C. Bradford, you know. You can tell when Bradford was paying attention to the screen or when he just wanted to land the oil and get out of it, it, when he just didn't give a flying damn about the picture. But so another related interesting question here that kind of fits in some of this. What is it from Karen Owen? What are the panelists' thoughts on incorporating sound effects or voices along with piano, organ, or other instruments are being played? <laughs> I, uh, I yeah, we're all shaking our heads. I think it's yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I just can't do this. I'm too busy playing, so I can't handle anything else. So it's just my, you know, it's beyond my capacity. So <laughs> I think it destroys the experience for the audience. It draws them away from the movie. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking at the piano. Right, thinking, right. Why is he knocking and, on the top of the piano? Yeah, yeah and it's and, not a sound film, you know. I mean, it's it's like it's not a sound effect. If we want to, so I'm going to add. I'm going to add a counter narrative to that, though. Uh -huh. I think there are exceptions. A good example is um, I use wind effects for the wind. You cannot watch the wind without wind effects. And when they did it in big theaters, they had wind machines. Oh yeah. Sound effects. Um, another oh, one yeah. is, is Garbo's The Kiss. Now that was released with a with an effect score, and if those who've seen the film, you know, there's a key scene where the door closes and there's a gunshot, critical gunshot, and and if you don't have a gunshot, that film makes no sense. Um, well, by I, gunshot, do you mean a literal gunshot? It's a literal, it's, a, it's, it's, the a door closes or something. Gar Garbo yeah. shoots somebody. Well, that was also, that's the last walk in, the door closes, and you hear a bang, and she comes out. Uh, so you need it there. Um, I just played for Girl Shy right before the shutdown, and, you know, there's a recurring thing where to get him to stop stuttering, you, they have a whistle. And so I have a whistle yeah. around my neck, and in the key scenes, I blow the whistle. Mm. So, I mean, I, I get it. You know, you don't want... You know, yeah, you could do it spar sparingly. sparingly. I'm just curious. Works. Yeah, I, I'm just curious because I think most of us have probably played for Docks of New York. And mm -hmm. there's a moment toward the end of it where... Uh, I'm blanking on the actress's name, but she goes in, she has a gun, and she's confronting her husband, and we cut to a shot of a window, and suddenly a whole bunch of seagulls fly away. And then we cut to something else, and we later, a shot or two later, learn that she's shot her husband. And I'm curious what everybody does. Uh, this is either as a sound effect, or do you leave it? Because 
this is an unusual visual cue. This is something, this is one of the things I talk about with my, in my classes about the things that we are not shown and are asked as an audience to figure out and how far do you lean in. I don't, I don't hit the, I don't do a gunshot sound. Uh, I mean, what I do is I'll build to a crescendo and try to make it match like a sting, a short stinger, musical stinger mm -hmm. that matches when the, when the birds fly away. Yeah. Uh, just so that the audience, an audience of today is like, why are we looking at a bunch of seagulls? I well, think we're talking about up, two. You can build up to the point and uh, you know, do that and drive it. And then if, if you know that you're building up to a real big point at the, at the stinger as it was, leave it silent as the birds fly away. Yeah, yeah, That's exactly. That's the highest thing that could happen. You know, they're, they're not going away squawking. It's, it's flight. Yeah. Um, and the other and thing it's a reaction is, to the gunshot. Yeah. And the other thing about sound effects is that as pianists, it doesn't work so well. For organ, no, that's if it's not an organ, that's another, yeah. that's another business. They yeah. have that toy counter designed yeah. for that yeah. purpose. Yeah, and, and some of them have wind, wind effects, yes. like that's the one of the... Wind effects, yeah. firing, yeah. Uh, gunshot, which is a rim shot on the yeah. snare drum. Yeah. Um, Telephones, yeah. birds, yeah. 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 But yeah. One of the greatest yeah. scores I ever heard for a silent film was Bob Vaughn, who some of the old timers remember, and yeah. Jeff Eric. He used to play at the Avenue Theater, which had that was what he called an effects organ. And he played the fire brigade. Mm. And in the big climax, he had sirens, he had explosions, and it was one of the most unfrickin' believable experiences. He was a gifted, gifted, gifted organist. That is and yeah. the irony is, I loved it so much when I did the Cinecon in San Francisco in 84, I wanted him to come do it and we got the print, but the Castro Theater organ didn't have the effects, and so we didn't have the sirens, we didn't have anything else. Yeah. And I thought, oh, it wasn't the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another question here. I love this question that somebody asked, because I was going to, I have that in my list of things I might do. What, ty what films or types of films are you sick of playing for? For, oh. What are people? I for me, it's biblical epics. I hate doing biblical. Epics. <laughs> what about others? I'm I hate westerns unless it's William S. Hart, which ah. those are really got a lot of drama. Tom Mix. I like Tom Mix and Hart. But. Yeah, I I like westerns. I'll tell you. Well, Nokia, I'm sorry. I don't like Soviet films. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got the message the first time. If it's a comedy. It's for the state. If it's a drama, it's for the state. If it's uh, a series, well, by the law, by the law, and House on Trebnaya Square are the two Russian. Oh, are what about That's Phil? Funny. Don't you love Miss Mend? Oh, oh God! I mean, not at, not at the speed yeah. that it runs at, and the restoration. <laughs> there was one shot. At, I said this was a Soviet joke. Is you know, uh, supposedly a czarist car pulls up. To the mortuary with a guy in the back seat, the touring car, and the mortuary opens up and they say, "We've got somebody for you." And the the mortuary owner says, "Ah, uh, we only take dead people." And then you see a puff of smoke, and then here he is. That's my idea of Soviet. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so um, we're, we're running we're running near to the end here. We're actually a couple minutes over, and I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to to all the the questions. Um, I, I do want to address one that someone put here as they said, are you editing out scenes of critical racial or ethnic <coughs> situations now? Um, I think my quick response to that is we're the accompanists. We, we right. tend not to do that, but it, but it is an issue. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone ever editing. Sometimes you make it. I'm, not to I'm doing it. that. I'm doing that on the watch party because we have kids watching. Yeah. We have young people watching and the show goes out to the planet. And if I have a show, and this is something we've been working on at the Silent Clowns film series, where because up till March we were presenting at the New York Public Library, we have no idea who's coming in or out of the shows. And some of the racial stuff in the, in the comedies, anyway, are, it's gratuitous. Um, and the whole punchline is, is not an actual gag. It's the fact that you're looking at an African-American person and that's the punchline. And it's, 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 uh, it doesn't get a laugh anymore. That's the thing. Uh, so in in some cases, yeah. Uh, not only that, uh, we showed Get Out and Get Under uh, a month or so ago, and I I managed to neatly remove uh, William Gillespie shooting up with the with the hypodermic, uh, and you don't know it's missing. 
Uh, but, be, uh, you know, there were local censors in the 20s cutting all sorts of stuff out of, out, out of prints and putting them putting back in or not. Um, what about it depends. Easy Street? Yeah, I don't show it. Easy, I don't, yeah, I don't show it. Yeah. I, I just want, you know, there are, there are some things that are just harder to, you know, talk to people under 30. And it's really hard uh, f for this sort of thing. Um, the, we showed uh, the Vagabond at the Silent Clans about three years ago. And in the beginning, Eric Campbell is just whipping Edna Provines. Yeah. And I heard an audi audible response from the audience and like, okay, we're not showing this. Uh, there are certain things that... Um, we, when we showed the goat a couple of weeks ago, there's that gag with the Native American uh, uh, in front of the cigar store. And um, I actually, there's a woman who follows me on Instagram and vice versa, who's been a huge fan of the show, who's Cherokee. And I contacted her and I said, tell me about this. How do I present this? Do we remove it? Do we leave it in? And we actually were able to contextualize it, in, not only in a really nice, authentic way, but she talked to a, a friend of hers who is Lakota, who watched the clip and said, you know, that guy is not just an actor who got a costume. The What he's wearing is the, uh, what uh, a Lakota warrior wears. And he clearly has is someone who earned this. Um, so we got uh, this other bit of authenticity. And, and it, we had to explain to the audience, and especially younger people who don't know what a cigar store Indian is, why this man is standing there and then chases Buster. Uh, so I think that... Um, it depends on the audience. I mean, it's Cinecon. Uh, you know, you have an, an audience that knows they're watching an old movie. But if you're you're showing something to kids and families, you have to. I think you have to be a lot more careful uh, these days, and especially since the end of end of May. I've been really, I've been really, well, even Steve and I have been really careful about what we show and what we don't show. And if there's a quick gag. We cut a couple of things out that, that are they were just gratuitous and they were funny because in 1924, uh, uh, seeing a, a shot of an African American doing whatever that was was hilarious. But it's not a gang anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you uh, know, so one of the problems is is that we're going to have to contextualize a lot more, many, many more films than we have ever before. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how I'm going to play the general. You know, well, that is a big, a that is a, I, I did, I did it, I did a show a year ago at a college campus and we had to be very, very careful and I made sure that the, the professor who hired me, I used to watch it, here's a link, uh, but there are people who won't be people, uh, there are younger people who just can't get past the fact that Buster is on the side of the Confederacy and there are some audiences who can acknowledge I'm watching an old movie and I get it and there's some people who you just have a different reaction, and, and it's it's really going to be yeah. We're gonna, it's going to be a case by case. I know Philip, you told me a few years ago you were booked to play on a college campus for the Navigator, and it got pulled. Yeah, and that's yeah. you know we're in this place where okay, uh, we want to show this comedian. Okay, well we can't show this one. <laughs> well, how about college? Well, we can't show the college. We can't show the general. Um, there's a scene in this film. Uh, what are and, we going? To you know, the, the, yeah, the, we can't show the general, uh, we can't show the navigator, as we right. say. Right, right. And the navigator, no, sure. Yeah. There's well, different, like, there's... In 20 even, why, even why worry? I yeah. mean... Yeah, you have your fake, fake Spanish people. I mean, it, it is something where we're going to have to... It's very important, um, and it, well, it is an issue we we're, we're all uh, going to have to, I mean, to I find a way, way to go through. This. In, in 2015, I actually went to the Kansas Silent Film Festival, and for the 100th anniversary, we did run the Birth of a Nation. But the context was that we did a panel discussion. We got Kevin Wilmot, who, of course, a couple of years later went on to win an Oscar for the screenplay for Black Klansman. Kevin Wilmot and I and Denise Morrison did a panel on racism in film. And Kevin said, well, you know, of course, it's a, a horrendously racist film, and we should absolutely show it. You know, we should show it. We should discuss it. We should put it in right. And I made the point, I said, well, you know, in, in, in The Birth of a Nation, you know, they put on the white robes and race off. In, in Gone with the Wind, it's a wink, wink, nod, nod that Bell Watling has to lie that, you know, oh, no, they were at my brothel instead of putting on their white capes. I said, it's a little more, you know, subdued, but it's equally racist. And Kevin said, oh, yeah, Gone with the Wind is a wildly racist film. But, you know, I mean, yeah. it's a Philadelphia story, the opening scene, a great classic comedy where, Cary Grant takes Catherine Hepburn and pushes her face with down the floor. That's assault. I mean, we would run that today. And say, oh my gosh, that's assault. 
or the running gag in our hospitality with the couple that are, you know, yeah. fighting. Yeah. Almost you know. any film made before the 1970s and many made after are going to be racist and sexist. And offensive. Yeah, so think, some things but, you can show, and, but yeah. you have to let the audience remind people that they, they're watching something made by people who were alive in the 1920s for, for people who were alive in the 1920s. And, but, but there are some things that it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, and it's, it's going to be yeah. interesting navigating this going forward. And we're going to be going forward. And right now, this is what happens, is that it's a pendulum. We're at one side of a swing, and it swings to the other way, and eventually we're going to come more or less back to an educated, I hope, yeah. I think Where that's absolutely right, and I think that's yeah. so right. I think that's maybe a good place to end this. Um, so uh, again, I want to really thank our panelists, Frederick, Andrew, Philip, Ben, Makia. Thanks for joining. Thanks to Niles for, for helping organize this whole series of, of film screenings, uh, uh, you know, interviews. There's going to be more in the fall, so please check out the, their website. Those of you who can, check out the Cinecon. It's free. Open. It's going to be basically openly broadcast Labor Day weekend. Um, again, I thank everyone. Thank all the people who have joined to uh, to listen, and thanks for a lot of great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. Maybe we'll come back in a couple months and do this again because I think we'll still be sitting at home on Saturday <laughs> yeah. in a couple of months. So uh, I think yep. that I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> again, thank, thank you all very much, both attendees and participants. Uh, I had a blast, and uh, we yeah, thanks, fun. thanks, John. Good to see yes. all you. Good to see yeah. you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank all you. Right. Yeah, good thank to see you all. Andrew, man, good to see everybody. Philip. All right, yeah, Frederick, bye -bye. nice to meet you. Yeah.